Amen. Amen. I love that line in there, let my life be a song revealing who you are. And I think that is like the perfect song to um, just kind of precede this message. Um, I am super glad that you are here and that you made it through the end of the world. How many are glad that you, you survived the end of the world yesterday and you're here? How many of you, just real honest right now, you had no idea that the world was supposed to end yesterday? You're just like, yeah, it, I, I appreciate that. It's it a whole bunch of baloney from some crazy. So, But uh, God has something for you this morning, and, and uh, it's not by accident that you've decided to come to church this morning. Whether it's your first time or your thousandth time in church, God wants to speak to you this morning. He wants to reveal something to you this morning, and he wants to use you in some capacity. God wants to use you. It doesn't matter your past. Um, it doesn't matter your degree or your race or your IQ or your weight um, or your, your failures or, or your bank account, what it says. God wants to use you, and I truly believe that, and I'm so excited to share with you um, all that God has laid on my heart as I've prepared this message. We're in a series that Pastor Hawkins started off last week titled, Jesus Is. And last week he uh, spoke a wonderful message, Jesus is the bread of life. And this week we're going to be looking at John chapter 8. So if you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. As many of you know, my mom and dad are on a vacation, but I've had very limited communication with them. Um, only about once every three days do I hear from them. And people keep on asking me, well, how are they doing? Are they having fun? You know, are, are they enjoying themselves? What, are, what have they been up to? Are, are they relaxed? Are they having a good time? And I've just, I've just had to tell them, I, I have no idea, you know. They're on this cruise ship somewhere in the Mediterranean, and since none, neither of them drink and neither of them gamble, I started to wonder myself. I'm like, well, what are they doing? What are they up to? So I was, I was able to uh, send a message to my dad, and I said, hey, what are you guys up to? Are you guys guys having fun, and, and I, I want you to watch this video he sent of himself. <laughs> Woo! Living the life, huh? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing, you know. Uh, he, he didn't, he didn't... <laughs> <laughs> He, he, didn't, he didn't really send that video. I still have no idea where they're at or what they're up to or if they're having a good time or a horrible time. Um, but I figured no news is good news. Um, and so just pray for them as they're on uh, this vacation that they'd be refreshed and refueled. And hopefully they're having as good of a time as those people were. Because that, uh, that's kind of what I envisioned. You know, when people were asking, I was like, they're probably playing with balloons. I don't know, you know. But Jesus says, I am the light of the world. What a declaration. We're going to spend some time unpacking the significance of that statement this morning, but I also want to remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5 where he's, he's uh, preaching the, the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking to all of his followers. He's talking to the church. He's talking to you, and he says this in 514. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. So I want you to be able to kind of think about that as we explore this text so that uh, you'll kind of see where I'm, I'm, I'm going with this. But turn to your neighbor um, and, and first tell him you're a light. Turn to your other neighbor and tell him you're a light. Now turn to the person behind you and say you're a light. Now t tap the person on front of your shoulder and say you're a light. Okay. My prayer this morning is that all of us would come to the realization that we have been called into a partnership with God to spread his light and his life to the ends of the earth. We all share that responsibility, and my prayer is that you would accept and acknowledge and accept that responsibility with all seriousness. So let's pray, then we'll jump into our text in John chapter 8 and get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much 
um, just for your presence. It's not just here, but it's in our hearts, God. I pray that those uh, that just need to be drawn into you this morning, that they would see your light. They would, they would uh, set their lives just centered around you this morning, God. And I just pray that your spirit would speak through this word, continue to shape me uh, as, as I listen to this sermon, God, and, and uh, just have your way in this service. Quicken your words by your Holy Spirit to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So John chapter 8, starting in verse 12, and we're reading through 20. You can follow along on the screens or in your Bibles. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered them, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself, and my other witness is the Father who sent me. They asked him, where is your Father? Jesus replied, you do not know me or my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put, yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Jesus makes this incredibly bold statement that he is the light of the world and that anyone who follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I think that reading this verse alone is very powerful, but it's not until we look at the entire context of when Jesus said these words, where Jesus said these words, and who Jesus said these words, It's not until we look at those three things until we can fully understand and appreciate these seven words. So in order to know when Jesus spoke these words, we need to take a look at John chapter 7. You might be asking yourself, why does it matter when Jesus spoke these words? Well, I'm glad uh, that you asked that question. It's a great question, but just hang with me, and you'll soon understand that timing plays a large significance. You'll see at the beginning of chapter 7, it places Jesus as being in Galilee. But then it says that Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles in secret. Okay, it's important to know that the Feast of Tabernacles was primarily set in place to remember the time that God led the Israelites out of captivity from the Egyptians. You can read about it in the book of Exodus. But that was the primary purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles that also signified the end of harvest time. It actually happened close to where we're at in the season end of September, middle of um, October. Verse 14 in chapter 7 says it wasn't until halfway through the feast that Jesus went to the temple courts to begin to teach. And then in verses 37 and 38 it says, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow within him. So the timing of that statement of whoever is thirsty come to me and drink, that statement was made on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 talks about Jesus being back at the temple courts the very next morning. Now there are varying opinions of whether or not uh, chapter 8 verse 12 is just a direct continuation of Uh, chapter 7 verse 52 or if John 7 53 through 8 uh, chapter 8 through 11 is in fact in the correct place in the Bible in this case it doesn't matter we know that the time that Jesus spoke the words I am the light of the world was either on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacle or the morning after the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles okay next we need to know where Jesus spoke these words in verse 20 It's much easier. It's there for us to see. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. This tells us exactly where Jesus was speaking when he made this bold claim. So we know the time is during or immediately after the Feast of Tabernacles, and we know the exact place was in the temple area near the place where the offerings were being put, so near the treasury. Why is that important? I'm so glad that this alert 1030 crowd asked me that question. 
because it is very important and insightful. Each night at the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a great ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple, which in, this involved the ritual lighting of four golden oil-fed lamps in the court of women. Now, these lamps weren't just these little lamps. These lamps were huge, 75 feet high huge, and there was four of them. Go ahead and show the picture of Salt Lake City in 2002, um, had the Winter Olympics there. That is the Olympic torch, and just as a perspective, you can see the people standing down in there at the base. That torch right there is only 72 feet high. You know, that's, that's impressive. Has anybody ever seen that and been there and seen that? Is it cool? Someone's like, yeah, yeah, it is, okay? I, I can just imagine how, how amazing that would be. And if you were to take and, and get rid of electricity and, and modern lighting and stuff, and you just to see this torch, imagine with me just how much light that giant flame at the top would just put off and just illuminate the whole area. So imagine there's four of these giant torches in, in the court of women that are, uh, are, are, are there and, and people are looking to these things. So these giant lamps are lit in the temple area at night to remind the people of the pillar of fire that had guided them in the wilderness journey. Remember, the Feast of Tabernacles was all about uh, the remembrance and the celebration of God delivering them out of captivity from the Egyptians. All night long, they shone their brilliance, illuminating the, the, the entire city. In celebration and anticipation of the return of the glory of God to Israel, the holiest of Israel's men danced and sang songs of joy and praise before God. This illumination ceremony was a reminder that God had promised to send his light into a sin-darkened world. God had promised to send the Messiah to renew Israel's glory, to release them from bondage, deliver them and, and restore their joy. Now remember that these huge lamps were in the court of women, okay? The court of women was directly adjacent to the temple courts where the offerings were put. So when Jesus makes the statement, I am the light of the world, he is talking to an audience that has either just been around or quite possibly is looking directly at these giant torches in the air. They knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. Jesus was declaring himself not just as the physical presence of God, but also as the guide also as their protector and the deliverer for all of Israel. Jesus was saying, without using words, just like God was with our ancestors and led them through the wilderness, I too will be your guide and I will lead you. Just like God gave them a new life and gave them hope and gave them purpose, I too will give you a new life. I will give you purpose. I will bring deliverance in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been searching for a light in your life that will bring purpose. Maybe you've been searching for a light that will give direction. Maybe you're searching for deliverance for, from some form of darkness, depression, anxiety, maybe some form of addiction. Maybe you've been looking for someone who can light up your life and bring value and purpose and meaning to you. Can I just tell you this morning that what you're looking for and who you're looking for is Jesus Christ? the light of the world, you will feel empty and dark in life until you completely surrender and follow the true light, Jesus Christ. And I'm not just talking about acknowledging Christ because there's a difference between acknowledging Christ and being completely, fully, 100% committed and, and surrounded and, and uh, surrendered to Christ. Can I just be real uh, just for a, a, a moment this morning? Okay. Um, how many have ever been awakened and you were not ready to get out of bed. Like, you still had a good two hours of sleep left. You, I mean, there were logs left to be sawed, if you know what I'm talking about, right? Man, when someone wakes me up from a deep sleep and I'm not ready to get out of bed, I'm not ready to wake up, and, and, and you, you know what I'm talking about. Like, the fan is on, my face is cool, I'm underneath this down comforter cocoon of love, and everything's just like perfect. You know, the conditions are just so inviting and warm, but someone comes in and, and they're trying to wake me up from this, this deep sleep in a, a gentle, kind voice, you know, that just doesn't cut it for me. They, they say, Austin, good morning. It's, it's beautiful outside. 
You, 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 you just take your time. I know you're tired. You can get out of bed. You, you just get out of bed when you're ready. You know, just slowly take your time. Wake up. No! No, man. When someone's waking me up when I, like, still have sleep to be, you know, to be had, you know, I need them just to, like, tell me how it is. I just need them to tell me, get in the face and be like, Austin, get up! Get up! Move it, soldier! Time's burning. You've got things to do. Parents of teenagers right now are like, have you been in my house this past week? <laughs> like, in this morning? This is all too real for you. You know, that, that sweet stuff just doesn't cut it for me when, when I'm asleep. Now, my wife, on the other hand, all I have to do is say, good morning, honey. It's time to get up. I love you. No joke. This morning, after I got ready, she's uh, still asleep, and, and I, I said, honey, it's time to get up for, for bed. I love you. Or get out of bed. She, oh, thank you. I love you, too. Just sweet as ever. No coffee. No nothing. I don't know if she sold her soul or what, but it's just like, <laughs> I hope my kids inherit that because we, we need that, okay? Hear me, I, I say this at the risk of sounding harsh. I say this at the risk of, of being abrasive and, and feeling a little bit slappy this morning. But I believe that there are many parents, grandparents, and people here that came asleep, and you have no intentions of waking up this morning, and you need someone to kind of get in your face and say, hey, get up, wake up. Please hear my heart this morning. I'm afraid that there are many of us that live a life acknowledging Jesus, but we're not completely surrendered and, and committed to Jesus. We acknowledge the light, but we don't sing and dance around it. We acknowledge the light, but we're, we're too distracted by the shadows, by our luxuries. And I'm not talking just about distracted by sin. You can be distracted by things that aren't sin. Family, work, hobbies. Man, we spend so much time, energy, and money trying to give our kids the opportunity to become great at something. Encouraging your kids to fine-tune a skill, to become a great athlete, to become a great musician, to be a fantastic scholar, that's great. And I understand that those things lead to scholarships. And, and when scholarships are handed out, oftentimes the kids that are, have the most impressive resume get the scholarships. And with college prices going up, I understand how a parent could push them, their kids to excellent in all different areas. But if we spend the majority of our time, energy, and money in, into raising great musicians and athletes and scholars, and very little of our time, money, or energy goes into uh, developing our kids to be strong, independent champions of faith who are biblically literate, then what does that teach our kids to do? My dad said this a couple months ago, but if we make our kids the center of our lives, we're teaching them to not make Jesus the center of their lives. Man, that, that is so convicting because my kids, there's times that when I'm at work, you know, and I'm just 15 minutes away, and I'm sure some of you can, uh, that are sappy like me can understand this, but when I'm 15 minutes away from work and I just look up at the pictures that I have of my kids in my office, my, I, I miss them so much, my bones hurt. I love them so much. You know, and maybe you don't understand that. Maybe I'm just completely weird, but I think most grandparents understand that with their grandkids. It's just like, man, I love my kids, and I love my grandkids so much. And it's so easy to present them with all of these opportunities that we think are going to make life great. But could it be that these opportunities, that, that we've been deceived in believing that, that uh, these opportunities are good, when in reality they just distract them from the real purpose and meaning of life? I think there's a popular uh, parenting trend in our culture right now, and that's loving your kid to hell. And people don't even realize they're doing it. We've got kids who are more involved and privileged than any other previous generation, yet suicide, depression, anxiety, and youth and children are at all-time highs. Could it be that parents are filling their kids with everything except the richness and the fullness of the presence of God? And I'm not saying that if your kid struggles with depression, it's your fault. There's absolutely depression that is caused by chemical imbalances, and I thank God every day for medicine. But I do know that the second and third fruits of the Holy Spirit are joy and peace. 
Our kids, our youth, our society now more than ever are looking for a light that brings life, that brings meaning, that brings deliverance, that brings purpose, that brings joy, and that is Jesus Christ. Ask yourself, parents, ask yourself, grandparents, are you living a life that revolves around Jesus Christ, or do you just treat God and church as a side chick? You just, you just come to church when it's convenient for you. You only obey God when it doesn't cost you too much. You know, family time is important. I understand that. I've, I treasure and value, how many of you treasure and value the time that you have family? I think that's why people love Christmas and love the holidays is because they're around family. And for some, you don't have family, and I, I, I'm sorry, um, you know, and those, those are painful times, but, but people value family time. But can I just say that family time is 10 times, 100 times, infinite times better when you spend it in the presence of God. Sunday night, watching your favorite show or, or going to the park or, or playing with your kids out in the lawn is fine, but you know what's better? coming to church on Sunday night where I can come down, take Sam as a toddler, come down to the altar and pray with him and teach him how to pray. Teach him what it means to be godly. Teach him what it means to dig into God's word and go deeper. Not just being satisfied with being filled on Sunday morning, but being satisfied where, man, I want more of God where I'm overflowing with God. Can I just tell you that family time in the presence of God is so much more important than just family time. And I'm afraid we've bought the lie that we're doing ourselves a favor by just spending lots and lots and lots of time with our families. Jesus is the light of the world that brings true, everlasting, all-satisfying life. I feel like everybody just needs to breathe for a second because that was a little intense. But now that we know the when and the where all this went down, we need to examine who Jesus was talking to. Chapters 7 and 8 list the priests, the chief priests, Nicodemus, who was a part of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and people, okay? So Jesus is talking to this large group of people, and it's important to understand that a large percentage of them were religious leaders. They were teachers of the law. They were considered as rabbis, which simply means teacher. Jesus was also referred to as a rabbi. But it's very important to know that Jesus made this claim, I am the light of the world in front of a large group of people, and and they were rabbis who interpreted and taught the word of God to others. Now, I've been studying some under Dr. Wave Nunley, and in one of his lectures, he took us through several different ancient rabbinic literatures Um, And he pointed something out that was so profound. And keep in mind that all of these texts that we went through were B.C. texts, meaning these texts were written and, and observed before Christ came into the picture. In many different texts, there were three things that were described as being the light of the world. The first thing were the rabbis. They were often referred to as the light of the world. They were the interpreters and the teachers of the word. They illuminated the word. Second, you'll see that the word of God was referred to as the light of the word, or the Torah. Okay, Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. So you've got rabbis that were referred to as the light of the world in these ancient texts. You've got the Torah, or God's word, being referred to as the light of the world in these ancient texts. And third uh, thing that was referred to as being the light of the world was the temple of God. Now the temple of God is where God's presence and spirit rested. It's where God's spirit dwelled. So the rabbis, the word, or the Torah, and the temple of God were all referred to as being the light of the world. So... When Jesus says in front of all these rabbis that are very familiar with this ancient rabbinic literature, I am the light of the world, Jesus is again saying, without using words, he's saying, I am the true and all authoritative interpreter and teacher of the word. I am, and not just the true interpreter and teacher of the word, but I am the word incarnate, the word in flesh. I am properly living out and demonstrating in a perfect manner the word. 
and I am the actual presence of God, for God's spirit has rested upon me. Man, how much more meaningful and rich do those seven words from Jesus mean once we know the when, the where, and who Jesus was talking to? And I, I learned something new in preparing this sermon, which I always love. How many else love to, to learn something new, right? But you know what? You can learn something new and walk out of these doors unchanged, and you might as well have just stayed home and gotten ready for Sunday football. At the very beginning, I threw out a verse of Matthew 5.14 where it says, Jesus says to his followers, Jesus says to his church, Jesus is saying to you this morning, you are the light of the world. Now, if someone else would have made this statement, I would have been a little taken back. It'd, it'd be like, whoa, that's a bit extreme. Don't you think that's kind of narcissistic? Don't you, don't you think that's, that's a bit much? But because Jesus said this, I have to chew on it, and I have to understand all that Jesus is implying when he tells his followers, when he tells you that you are the light of the world. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, you're the light of the world. You will guide people. You will, you will lead people. You will live out the word of God here on earth, in your workplace, in your school, in your home. You, you will lead people out of darkness. You will, you will lead people to the light that brings deliverance. This is my favorite. You will carry the presence of God with you. Ask yourself right now, is your light bright? Is your light bright, or are you a dimwit? Huh. <laughs> I thought of that one in between services. That's not in my notes. Free. Is your light eclipsed? Are you more of a closet Christian Monday through Saturday, but your spiritual pants, you know, get put on Sunday and and who high and holy, going to church? And this morning, God wants to shine his face upon you. He wants to fill you with light. He wants to give you his presence so that you can fulfill what he has planned for your life. He wants you to be filled with his spirit so that you can be a witness, an effective witness. You know, for whatever reason, God chooses to use us as his main tool when, when bringing his lost children home. Ask yourself this, when was the last time you invited someone to church? Say, so, oh, well, that's kind of an easy question just to, to throw out and cause conviction. No, I ask that question because I truly believe that the heart of God is, is that he is searching for his lost children. And if we don't have the heart of God, then we're probably not concerned with, you know, finding and, and going after and seeking lost children. But if you have the heart of God, and you have the spirit of God in your life, then you're gonna be very active in your faith. The, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where Jesus, his last words on earth, he says, go out, make disciples, baptizing, preaching, teaching, go to the ends of the earth, I'll be with you, and all that. He doesn't precede that and say, okay, everybody who's outgoing, everybody who is okay talking in crowds, go out. The rest of you guys, you just, just be good, just good people, right? He doesn't proceed um, by, by saying, oh, you know, let the pastors and the leaders do that. No, he says, go out. We're all on the same hook this morning. We all have the same responsibility this morning. When was the last time you invited someone to church? When was the last time you prayed for someone you didn't know? The Holy Spirit does not give us a spirit of, spirit of fear or a spirit of timidness, right? When was the last time you listened to the Holy Spirit that was gently nudging you to go somewhere, to do something, to say something? Isaiah 60 verses two through three says this, darkness as black as night covers all of the nations of the earth. How many is like, wow, that's like right now, right? There's a lot of dark stuff that's going on in the world right now. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. 
The best thing about God is that he doesn't call us to this impossible task of being the light of the world without first equipping us. He doesn't call you and just say, all right, buy your bootstraps, just pull it up and be a good person. You're on your own. No, every morning you have the ability and you have the chance when you're getting ready to say, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit this morning? Would you open my eyes so that I can see people the way that you see them? Would you give me a heart for your lost children? Would you allow me just to be a vessel and whatever you do in whatever time capacity that takes and whatever I need to give up or do, God, I'm your servant. Just fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can be your servant because you've done far more anything than I could ever ask for or deserve and so I'm your servant. You guys each have the power and the ability to do that. If you do that every morning it would change your life completely. It would change your life because you know what he would do? He would replace your eyes for God's eyes. He would replace your heart for God's heart. He would replace your ears for God's ear and you'd start to see the world completely different. Do you bow your heads, close your eyes this morning? Put away all distractions. There are three different people in this room this morning. The first type of person, there might be some here that, that have never come to the light. You're still living in darkness and, and you just feel like you need out. You need deliverance. You need to repent and turn from sin. You need to make Jesus the center of your life. And you are ready for change. You are willing to count the cost and come to Christ this morning, knowing that when I come before you, I understand that I am leaving things behind, but I am gaining everything. I am gaining life and everlasting life and all satisfying life. I'm gaining the hope of the world. You're, you're ready to have the light of the world that that enters your life and brings hope and peace to forgive you of all your sins, if that's you and you're saying, Austin, for the very first time in my life, I want to fully acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've acknowledged him, you've seen Jesus kind of through the peripheral, but you've never set your eyes on Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. And this morning you're saying, Austin, I need to be forgiven of my sins, I need to be set on paths of righteousness, and I need Jesus to come inside and do a work and bring light to my life. On my right, your left, is there anyone here for the first time that would say, Austin, I'm asking Jesus into my heart and I want you to pray for me. Now as I'm sweeping across the center two sections, is there anyone, yes. Yes. Now my left, your right. God, you see these two hands and I just pray this morning that, that your forgiveness and your love would just overwhelm them, that they would understand that their past does not matter, but that you have a bright hope for them. I pray that you would cleanse them of all unrighteousness, that you would set their paths in, in, in ways of righteousness, and uh, God, that you just save them by their grace, that they wouldn't feel like they're saved and they have to do it by themselves, but by your spirit, enter their hearts and make them a new creation this morning. Continue with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning. I believe that there are many that have been deceived. That there are many that have, have maybe been asleep and you weren't expecting to be waking up this morning, but the Holy Spirit's been nudging on your heart and saying, hey, you aren't shining your light the way I want you to shine your light. Or, hey, you've been trying to shine your light on your own and, and you've been running on batteries, but now it's time to plug into the, the source of power and shine at your full capacity. Maybe you've been realized this morning the Spirit's like, man, you've been distracted, and not necessarily by sinful things, but by your family or by your work or, or, or sports or hobbies, whatever it is, and you'd say, you know, Pastor Austin, this morning I need to redirect and refocus uh, my eyes and my attention on Christ. I need to make him the center of everything once again. And you want to refocus and be refilled this morning. Would you raise your hand this morning saying, Austin, I don't want to just be a half light. I want to be a full light. Raise your hand across this room. Yes, yes. Yes, God, I pray for every hand in the air right now that they wouldn't feel um, the overwhelming task, but they would feel your presence that comes inside them, enables them, and, and, and makes them able to, to be your witness, God. I, I pray that if you are convicting them of certain things that they need to change, that they need to get up in the morning and start their day with the word of, of God instead of 
a cup of coffee, God. I just pray that, that whatever you're speaking right now to these individuals, Lord, that, that they would be empowered by your spirit to do it and that they would shine bright. And God, I pray for everyone else who, who didn't raise their hands, that they feel like, man, I'm just connected with God. I am being a light. I am, I am living this out. I am leading people out of darkness. God, I pray that you would continue to fill them with your spirit. Continue to fill them and give them the supernatural ability to shine bright. Encourage them and strengthen them. Give them endurance this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said... Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Grab your cell phone. If you don't have a cell phone, we are in the 21st century. But we're going to do something a little bit different. So I need everybody to take out your cell phone. Some of people already know this. Turn on your light. Turn off the lights in here. We're going to sing this song. I want you to sing with me. Go ahead and shine all your lights. All the old people are like, turn the lights back on. I need to find my phone. All right, no, just teasing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right, now... Half of you guys are happy right now, and the other half of you are like, this is lame. No, you're lame. You're lame. Okay? We're going to sing the second and third verse, and I want full participation. You shine that around. You shine it in your neighbor's face. You do whatever it is, but don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Woo! All right. So here's my challenge to you this week. Let your light shine. Whether that means and looks different for you, maybe you need to bring your Bible to lunch at work and you just need to let other people know. Maybe there's been someone that God's been speaking to you that you need to invite them to church and you've just kind of been pushing it off out of fear of rejection or whatever. Let your light shine.